because it can be really liberating, it can be amazing, it can be lovely. me cutting my hair at home and how I feel about it but it could also be titled Lena overthinks an ultimately trivial action until everyone is bored to compensate for her lack of real human stimulation and an unrealistic academic itch that can neither be scratched nor acknowledged lest she have to act on it in any meaningful way. Instead, this video. So Lena on the right is going to tell you about my personal history with fringes, the wider historical context of the fringe, and maybe pontificate about any meaning we can painfully extract from this madness. Lena on the left is going to bring about a utopian communist future in which everyone- No, no. Lena on the left is going to be cutting her own fringe while we talk. Okay, first we're just going for a trim. So this should be pretty fast and I actually don't really care how even it is because I'm trying to grow my hair out and I don't trust hairdressers. Also to all the Americans watching who want to tell me that actually the word is bangs. Fringe is, is the word. I don't know what to tell you. Bangs is your word. <laughs> Personally, I prefer the word fringe because of the accuracy. Fringe is a very old word. We'll get to that later. Whereas bang is a 19th century American word from, that comes from a reference to horses. And as when women and other people are linguistically tied to animals, it's never for a good reason. Given the choice, I think I'll stick with fringe, thanks. Petty, I know. Anyway, I am no stranger to the fringe. I am a stranger to hairdressers though. In fact, it's possible that I've cut my own hair more times in my life than I've ever let another human. And for those of you old faithfuls, you might remember that I've also cut my own hair in front of you twice already. So if you think about this, this is actually technically the third in an 11 year series. <laughs> Oh, I'm gonna burn my face off. I have to be up tomorrow because I oh, can't believe my hair. My hair's over there. My hair, hair should be on your head. No, I'm trying to analyse why I did it. Why? I, why? Why? It's not even even. Nothing good will come of this. But the fringe for me has never stuck. I've always found that the way I cut it ended up making my face seem rounder than it actually is. Can somebody please tell me, just please, definitively whether I have a heart-shaped face or a round face? Because I've taken so many inconclusive internet quizzes at this point. And the other reason it hasn't stuck around is because frankly, I've been too lazy to style it. Of course, there have been some notable fringes that have called to me like sirens in high tides, tempting me back, Mary from the Secret Garden, Kira Knightley in Pride and Prejudice, the Dainty Squid. But then, but then, April 2020, I started fantasizing again about what life with a fringe would be like. I started doing the maths and I realized that every woman I've ever met or seen on TV that I've thought, hey, they're cool, automatically has had a fringe. And if it's a style that I've always intrinsically loved, why am I denying myself the small luxury of a fringe? But on the other hand, do you need one of those faces to pull off a fringe? And what does one of those faces even entail? And who decides who the face is? What? Still clinging to my hope that true democracy is possible, I turned to Instagram and asked you. <sighs> but alas, the outcome was even less clear than Brexit. Or was it? No fringe, fringe. No fringe, fringe. Half a fringe, micro fringe. Micro fringe, micro, micro, micro fringe. Okay, it's, okay, it's not. Just to t testing my mic. <laughs> Hold that thought. One of the mistakes I made two other times that I cut my fringe was taking it from too far back. I was really into like the Zoe de Chanel helmet idea, um, but I want to do it way more gradually this time and see if it looks a bit better and less helmety by doing this. And also because my forehead is so wide, apparently it's better if you don't cut the sides and you kind of feather them down. So I'm also gonna try that, but that potentially leaves me with not that much hair to actually play with, and it might look like a really stringy fringe as I have very fine hair. So fine as in thin, not fine as in fine. Maybe I'll graduate to fine after today. The use of the word fringe in relation to grooming has developed from the original centuries old word in English, an ornamental border. According to etymologists, the words medieval ancestor is a word in colloquial Latin. Frimbia. 
which is what I really kind of want to call it now. An alteration of the classical Latin fimbria, border. I need some assistance. Okay. I don't know how to open it. <laughs> is it stuck? I do it the whole way in first. I think you need it the whole way in. And if not, I'd put some fairy liquid around the edges. I, be I believe in you. <laughs> now, Osana, she was having trouble getting into a bottle of wine. And I am always the friend to call when that's a problem. The noun came into Middle English via some old French. 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 Which is how it was originally spelt, apparently. And then we swapped the E for an I, kind of in the same way we did with hinge and singe. When it was first recorded in the 14th century, fringe meant a ribbon with little bits of thread dangling off, sometimes gathered in tassels or twists, according to the OED. One of its earliest appearances is in 1327 in the wardrobe accounts of King Edward III. It also appears in Gawain and the Green Knight, who was forced to read that book growing up. And it was usually used in reference to decorating things like helmets, garments, and even saddles. As the centuries went on, the word fringe did start applying to hairstyles, but also to other things that existed either figuratively or literally on the edge in the margins. On the fringe of society, the fringes of Paris, the fringe theatre, the fringe vote, and very much later, the Edinburgh Fringe. You can also have a fringe of foam or a fringe of trees. I do enjoy some of the American connotations of the word bang when I was doing this research as well though. Bag bang comes from bagtail, which is an animal's tail that has been grown long and then lopped off really fast in a very uncaring fashion. But, uh, with a bang. <laughs> So essentially what I'm trying to say is the history of the fringe as a hairstyle is kind of a weird concept because if we're really describing what we're actually trying to do, we'd probably say something like the history of people cutting the hair that grows in front of their face out of their eyes. Like if your hair grows out the top of your head and it grows down, these bits are always going to be the most annoying and the most logical thing to do is to cut them out of the way. Especially if you have no way of securing it back or you're a butterfingers with plaits. It's the kind of obvious conclusion to that very simple Rubik's Cube. <coughs> cut it out of your eyes as high as possible but also maybe leave some because it's cold and maybe you don't want to get sun damage on your forehead. It's kind of like a massive forehead eyebrow when you think about it like that. It's there to protect you, it's there to keep the dust and the wrinkles off your face. Oh, I think there's some developments going on. Okay. Second one. Oh god. Oh my god, I kinda like that. I look like Monica. Oh, and the sun goes in. Prophetic fallacy, hey. I'll show you. I'm gonna look great. I'm gonna look great. Fuck you. From what I can tell, there are three early records of the fringe, like when people thought it was enough of an innovation to write it down. The first possible hairstyle that could qualify as a fringe was in ancient Egypt. Not started by Cleopatra, as the myth goes. Fun fact, you only think that because in the 1968 version, Elizabeth Taylor played Cleopatra and she fancied a fringe. And you know, who bothers trying for historical accuracy when you cast a white woman from Hampstead to play an ancient Egyptian ruler? Anyway, the way Egyptians wore their fringe could be described as something close to the modern day fringe. It has this circular cut and shape, but for them it was the quality of the wig that was more telling than the style. Early hieroglyphics confirm that it was royals and really, really important rich people who would prefer the fringe. And they also employed people to look after their wigs full time. These people were not messing around. It wasn't just posh people that wore wigs though. And you could have it with a shaved head or with your own hair underneath. And wigs were there to also reduce the harm of the sun's rays on your head. It means that you could have really groomed, intricate hairstyles while your head could remain relatively cool because the base of the wigs were made out of this mesh string thing with holes so your little head could be ventilated. So I guess if they were concerned about the sun, we can speculate that the function of the fringe was also to protect the head from the sun's rays, but it's just my, that's just my guess. Another guess that's just my own is that because from articles I've read, it's, you know, often human hair and incredibly expensive to make. It could be like a showy off thing. Like I've got so much money and so much hair to spare that I can also have a little tassel at the front. Fuck you, I'm glamorous. Well, <laughs> we've done it now. <laughs> Shout out to Naira, an actual Egyptian lady, and Harriet, who has a master's in archaeology, specialising in Egyptology, who are both lovely members of the Gumption Club and helped me navigate the very hairy online information about Egypt and hair. Naira was even able to point me in the direction of some Arabic articles I could read kind of through Google Translate. So if you are interested, and it is really interesting, I'm going to leave some links to that all below. Not gonna lie, so far I kind of hate it, but I'm keeping an open mind. <laughs> Thank you.
Oh god. Oh no. Over to the 4th or 5th century in the UK and the Roman coronial tonsure is all the rage. Which my boyfriend quite rightly pointed out to me when I text him a picture of my new hair and he called me Friar Tuck. It does kind of resemble the modern day fringe. Tonsure just means the practice of shaving all or part of your head as a sign of religious devotion and you can find it in Islam, in Judaism, in Hinduism, in Buddhism. So it's noted that tonsure isn't a specifically Christian thing, but coronal tonsure is specifically a Catholic Christian thing, possibly to mimic the crown of thorns that Jesus wore. Grim. <laughs> but there's also a suggestion that Celtic Christians before the arrival of the Roman Catholic Church were rocking some kind of tonsure before meeting the rotten Romans. We don't know for how long, but they did potentially look like this. Now that is a commitment to the fringe. <laughs> Sadly, they were outlawed by the Romans who were kind of pushy in their particularities. So the Celtic tonsure was a sign of rebellion if you still chose to keep wearing it. Although I don't know how long you would get to live if you did. Plus for women, as with anything fun, and any significant role in religion at that time, it was viewed as being scandalous if you wanted a haircut like this and you were a woman. Okay, the plan is I'm gonna cut it so it curves, but then if I hate it, I can cut more on this side and make it a side. I actually maybe prefer that. Yeah, let's, let's do that, let's do that. I think that's gonna, let's do that. <laughs> we might need that bit of her hair as an ally at some point actually, let's not cut her. We might need you to cover up this mess. Okay, I'm not gonna get a good idea until I cut the rest, so let's just do it so that I can tell whether this was as bad as I think it is. Okay, that's gonna look so much better. It's gonna look so much thicker. Isn't it? Isn't it? And the third record I could find of early fringes was in the royal court of the Arab Empire in Spain. There, there was a poet, composer, astronomer, all-round talented trendsetter Zeyab, who's had a huge influence over loads of different inventions and customs we have today, but surprise, 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 surprise. is very underdocumented in the West. Classic. His ethnic origin is kind of disputed. Different sources list him as Arab, Kurdish, or African, but he lived and worked in what is modern day Iraq, Northern Africa, and Spain. He sported this fringe and his admirers really liked it and it caught on and it was a whole thing. Anyway, back in England in the 16th century, fringes were out. Elongated foreheads for women were in, but apparently fringes were still fine for men. We want to see your long turnip head. According to the Encyclopedia of Hair, fringes for women were a controversial statement and conservative clergy regarded women who cut or curled their fringe to be on their way to committing a mortal sin. As time goes on though, women come out from the fringes towards having fringes again and they appear frequently in portraits of women, sometimes only in the peeking out from a bonnet, sometimes part of a flowing overall look. In the 1880s, super curled bangs became a massive thing because Princess Alexandra, who would one day become Queen of England after marrying Edward VII, and she'd like arrange all of her hair on top of her head so that it all fell over her forehead and it was kind of called the Alexandra fringe. Then in the 1920s, things started really kicking off. Why am I so excited about fringes? Up until that point, women hadn't really had much variation in the hairstyle to choose from. And according to Rachel Gibson, who is better known as the hair historian, love her Instagram account, do check it out. Women would grow their hair long, but wear it up after marriage. But when the famous flapper bob, which also was usually accompanied by a fringe came into fashion, people didn't know what to think. And women who had that haircut were seen as really rebellious and sometimes insane. Apparently there are even stories of fathers suing hairdressers who gave their daughters haircuts like this because they thought it would ruin their chances of them getting married. The Fringe was given a new lease of life by Louise Brooks, who in the 1920s and 1930s was a real famous American dancer and actress, and specifically the very blunt Fringe became synonymous with sex, flappers, autonomous women, and glamour. Although to be fair, it does look a little bit like the Egyptian style, so I don't want to call it an innovation, but... Betty Page went one step further and gave herself a real really big fringe that curled up at the sides and she did it not because it was cool but because it was practical she was this very ostentatious very controversial pinup model and she apparently cut her fringe when a photographer suggested her doing it because the light in the photo studio kept like f reflecting off her forehead while she was being photographed so she was just like solution bailey sarian made a really good video all about the history of her and that's a whole other kettle of boiling fish <laughs> 
then I'd say that's when the floodgates just started opening. Like Audrey Hepburn, cascades of other notable fringes, Brigitte Bardot, Peggy Moffat, Abba, Linda Evangelista, Christy Turlington, Naomi Campbell. Fringes, as far as the eye can see, leading us up to today. Zoe de Chanel, Taylor Swift, Tyra Banks, Emma Stone, Beyonce, and Daisy Edgar Jones. So while the invention of the fringe was originally attributed to men, although let's face it, if it was a woman who started it, the chances of that getting accurately recorded is uh, next to zero. Interestingly, in my reading about fringes, it seems that when a fringe sits on the forehead of a woman, they undergo, in the eyes of everybody else, an extreme change. Either aggressively innocent or eternally deviant. I guess it's an innocence because it can so easily be linked to childhood, to be fair. I had this haircut when I was a child, and because it's linked now to the trope of the bouncy, quirky, manic pixie dream girl here to save all your problems. And on the other hand, it's kind of a rebellion because of its links to sexual prowess, alternative cultures, and well, looking like a monk. And there's no real guarantee that other people will like it. It's kind of a Marmite haircut. The shorter and the blunter, the more polarizing. Now, a lot of women are more free and all that. The choice to get fringe has taken on some more like self-mocking connotations. How many times have you seen a meme about had a breakdown, had a breakup, cut my own fringe, lol. Even Michelle Obama jokingly referred to her own fringe as a symptom of a midlife crisis. Okay, we've had a breakthrough. I actually do like it, but just bear with me. Because my face is so wide, this straight on feels a bit much to me. And because my hair is so long, it feels very, it feels too 70s. And I don't wear that much 70s clothes. I'm not really a 70s child. It feels a bit too much, but with a parting, which I will now trim because extra bits coming out. I also realised that when you're doing this you have to keep moving your hair around to see which other bits will get in your eyes when you move in the world. <laughs> you have to work out who's going to be in your dance space. Also my favourite thing is realising where exactly you're going to wrinkle when you're old. Like I can already see those lines. Forging a trench in the battle for youth. Oh my god okay I really like it with a side. I, I love it. I love it. <laughs> I'm excited. If I have a parting here and I get used to that. Oh my god, then I really like it. I really like it. Oh, I'm so relieved. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus Christ. Some people aren't gonna like it. It will definitely get take some getting used to. Oh my god, look at it with my hair up. But when I think about me, changing my haircut isn't ever really, on reflection, a cry for help. I don't think. Even if at the time I've joked about this, it's probably come from a place of preempting other people joking about it. For me, it's always been a way of externalizing a change that's gone on inside, kind of marking it on the outside so it feels more real and also to celebrate it as a celebration of that. I wonder if we make self-deprecating jokes about cutting our own fringe so often as a way of continuing this trope of hysterical female to ourselves, a preemptive don't worry, I don't think I'm pretty or attractive. No need to remind me I'm not. My choices aren't valid or subjective. Did I? <laughs> have I ever thought it? I have. I've ever thought it. Yes. Yes, I have. But in summary, if there is a summary to whatever this is, I think a fringe is what you make it. It's a political statement. It's a way to feel older. It's a way to feel younger. A way to look as brave as you one day hope to feel on the inside. Simply a way to stop having to tuck your hair behind your ears every goddamn time. A way to look sexy. A way to say, I don't care if you find me sexy. A way to look a little bit more like Marianne from normal people. Or maybe simply just because you fancy a forehead eyebrow. <laughs> And that's what you call going out with a bang. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching this video. If you liked being here and you'd like to be here again, do consider hitting the subscribe button. That makes it much more likely. Have you ever had a fringe? Have you ever considered having a fringe? Do you think it was a bad idea that I, I don't actually wanna know the answer to that. If you have a tendency for existentialism and when you think introspectively about your own hair and its significance, it's also really important to look outside of your own experience. I've been reading Don't Touch My Hair by Emma Dabry. It's really wonderful. It talks about the decolonization of hair and how different people experience hair. This video was made possible by my friends at The Gumption Club. They're simply a group of like-minded, lovely people who tip me for these videos, so they're free for everybody to watch, whilst also giving me the time to research and create them at the same time as getting a good night's sleep and not working weekends. We have a secret Facebook group where we have existential crises every day so if you'd like to be part of that do click the link below to hear more about it on top of some free poetry more video essays here if you're in the mood and youtube thinks you'll like this video thank you so much for watching this video if you do end up cutting your fringe please send me a picture i'm on instagram at lena norms whatever your plans for your own hair i hope you don't stay on the fringes of your own ambitions and until next time frogs dog out
Give me oil in my lamp to 